You are listening to Community Radio, WERU-FM, 89.9 Blue Hill, 99.9 Bangor, and on the web at WERU.org. Listener-supported and volunteer-powered, a voice of many voices. Stay tuned. The Wicked Good Music Hour is coming right up. And welcome to another edition of the Wicked Good Music Hour with your host today, Matt Murphy. Thanks very much for tuning in, and thanks to Kit for all the high life there. Very cool. Our theme music is Blue Goose by the Tough Cats. The Wicked Good Music Hour is all about local music, live music, and main music. And today, though, we're going to take a break from the usual live studio performances to present an interview I think you'll enjoy that I recently recorded with Harry Weiss, a 97-year-old musician living in Bangor, where he moved around six years ago to be near family. Harry is also a great storyteller, as you will soon hear, and is a warm and wonderful person on top of that. All the piano music you'll hear on the show today was performed and recorded by Harry in the fall of 2014 and just in the last couple of weeks here in 2015. We'll start out with Harry's response to my question, how did you get started in the music business? My sister took piano lessons. We had a piano in the house. And uh, I sort of gravitated to it when I was about three and a half, four years old. I liked hear music, and I started playing around, fooling around with the keys on the piano with some songs that I could sing or something, and I I found myself playing, and I got curious about it, and uh, my, my parents said, well, well give, give them an instrument to play with, so they bought me a violin, because <laughs> boys don't play piano, boys play violin, girls play piano. Like a three-quarter size violin. I, by the time I was six, five, six years old, and I broke it in one day. I mean, I just, I didn't like it. They bought me a drum. I put a hole in the drum very quickly. <laughs> so I said, I want to play piano. So they, they started to give me lessons when I was eight, something like that. I took to it very quickly, but my teachers didn't like me because they said I learned everything very quickly, but I didn't play them properly. I was just too quick. I was just playing notes. I wasn't doing the right thing. Well, this went on, so I stopped taking lessons. I never took continuous lessons. I stopped taking lessons. By the time I was 10 or 11, I took lessons again, uh, played more piano. And then, uh, by that time, I was beginning to improvise on the piano and uh, play my own conceptions of music that I heard including classical music that we, we learned in elementary school. They would play Wagner and Tchaikovsky, and they had a, 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 a verse or expression or sentence that went with each one, like, this is the symphony that Schubert wrote and never finished. So it would remember that, you know, in the hall of the mountain king, mountain king, mountain king, in the hall of the mountain king. And uh, I liked it. I, I liked music. And it got to the point where I was about... I guess 11 years old, at the neighborhood house where they had, you know, kids came in the afternoon, played basketball, had games and stuff like that. During Christmas, I played carols for Christmas, Christmas program. I was 11. I didn't know the music, but I heard it. And just hearing it, I knew. I mean, you know, I learned the music. And I played carols for them. By the time I was 13, I was taking lessons again. And this, is a, this was an important thing at this point. I was pretty rough with my music. You know. The teachers didn't like me. Uh, uh, but the music school gave a recital at a public library. This was on 53rd Street and Lexington Avenue in Manhattan, in New York. I lived in New York. That's where I was born. I was born on 49th Street, near the river. That's another story. But, um, and we had a, re- a concert, a recital. And I, by that time, I was playing some pretty heavy stuff. Well, I mean, for me, heavy. 
So I had to play a Bach prelude and fugue. That was my recital. Walter Damrosch was a very famous conductor in those days. He conducted the Philharmonic, uh, 1926, 1927. Uh, he was there. He came over to me afterwards, and uh, he said, you know, you seem to understand what you're doing. I said, that's nice. <laughs> he says, but you ought to learn how to play. He says, you play a lousy piano. You know, but the things that you did made sense. So, um, uh, okay, that, that took care of that. I didn't take any more lessons. I quit. I got my first job playing music when I was 14. I played with a small band. I joined the union when I was 16 and went on the road. And I was playing piano and, and I was getting more and more interested. My father was getting more and more mad because he didn't want his son to be a musician. He wanted him to be a, a philosopher, a psychologist, <laughs> or something, he said. He didn't want me to be a musician. Uh, and, uh, but that didn't matter. So I said, when I was 16, I went, on, uh, I went out, out of town on a job with a band. And uh, it was at a resort. And we played at the resort until 11 o'clock at night. And then there was a nightclub nearby, and we got a job at the nightclub to play at night. And I had no right playing in that nightclub because it was a naughty place. And I was only 16. And nobody knew about that. Just the guys in the band. They were all 22, 23. <laughs> I was the kid. Uh, that was an interesting experience, playing in a nightclub. When you play something like St. Louis Blues, you know, St. Louis Blues, real fast, and this girl's doing a strip, you know. <laughs> and it was, anyway, that was my first experience with that kind of work. Because later on, I worked in burlesque for a couple of weeks to, for somebody who, was, who, was, who took off. But uh, that's how I got into the music business.
that's how I got into the music business. And uh, I got to the point that, and yet I continued, you know, I graduated high school, went to college, and I majored in political science. Well, I was interested in working for the uh, Foreign Service, Consular Service. So I majored in international relations, international government, uh, international law. And then after, when, when I applied to the uh, State Department, I got an application to apply for a job when I graduated. They turned me down immediately. They didn't even consider my application because my parents were born in Russia. And that, that was enough. I said, now what do I do? I said, become a teacher. <laughs> Teach music. You can do it. You know all this stuff. I mean, you, meanwhile, I, by that time, I was writing arrangements for people, for singers, for dancers, for groups. You know, I was doing all kinds of music, directing a high school uh, um, presentation, theater presentation. I would, and my own, and City College, I... I uh, I directed the productions at City College, musical productions that we had, City College in New York. I wanted to go teach music, so I started, went for my master's at NYU in music education. And while I was there, I applied to the city of New York to teach. Well, they turned me down flat because they didn't like my voice. They said, you know, you're going to be a music teacher, you also have to teach voice, and you don't set a good example. I had an, and then I, my, I, I sounded too much like a New Yorker. They said I had a dental iced tea, a low S, and an NG click. <laughs> I used to say Long Island <laughs> you know, instead of Long Island. And those days they were very fussy. By the end of the war, they didn't care. They didn't care how you spoke or how you dressed. I, I should have waited, maybe. But uh, when they turned me down, I gave up on it, and I... I went into music full, full, full blue, and I joined. I played with a quartet, a jazz quartet, and we, uh, and we were in Chicago when the war broke out, 1941. I was already married for a year. I was playing accordion with the quartet, accordion, clarinet, bass, and guitar. Uh, but we were a good quartet, and we were just about to be uh, contracted by uh, Decca Records to make records. The war broke out, the bass player was drafted, the guitar player was drafted, and this was in the middle of December, 1941. And they were taken immediately. We broke, we broke up after a couple of weeks, we just finished out our, our stay, and the quartet broke up. And strangely enough, when I got through with, uh, with that, I came back to New York, I started getting involved with other kinds of music, besides just playing. And I ended up teaching keyboard harmony in a music school, as, as part of the work I did, besides writing for people. And uh, and I had to think uh, seriously about the Army. Even though I was married, they're going to be drafting everybody. So I decided to enlist. I said, if I enlist, I can enlist at least in what I want to do, I hope. So they said, why don't you go into music? And the, the story I always say is, I heard too many stories about first sergeants not liking wise guys who know their music. See, so, I mean, this is not, wasn't really true, but these are the stories I got. So I said, I'm not going to do music in the Army. Friends of mine went in as musicians. They did nothing but play music all, all through, the, through their Army career. Uh, they were good. But uh, so I, I, uh, I enlisted and, uh, and I volunteered to do Japanese. And... Uh, I, end, I went to school, I didn't go to, I was in the reserve, I didn't go to an army school. I went to a private school and studied radio, and I became a second class telegraph operator, first class telephone operator, and I knew my stuff, I could design, ampl I could design, uh, I could design stations. Um, you know, what happened to my, my language? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working, I'm talking too fast. I'm not, uh, it's not, not good. Um, I, could, so I, I could design a radio station. I mean, with, with, uh, with, the, all, with the equipment and so forth. I couldn't operate it, but I knew it was design. <laughs> it's all on paper. Well, so I was in the Army, and then they, they called me up when they wanted me, 
and they put me right in with the Japanese because I knew the Japanese code. I learned that from a guy who was a marine operator in the China Seas years before. He was teaching. And he wanted, if anybody wanted to volunteer, they said, you're crazy. They'll send you to a little island in the Pacific. You'll be in trouble, you know. I said, look, I think I can do it. Well, the point is I did it, and I did it well, to the point where I didn't have to worry about that. I was doing high echelon work and monitoring Japanese communications and stuff like that. And I did that for the war. But while I did that, and I ended up in Hawaii, and while I was there, I did music. I did music wherever I went. I played in USOs. I played in the library. I played for groups, different groups. Uh, the Navy rest station at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. I went in there and played on oh, my days off. To the extent, not that I should say to the extent, to the point that the vice president, the wife of the vice president of the Bank of Hawaii, who also played for the, for the man, heard me play. She wanted to do what I did. So I gave her lessons. In uh, piano? On piano, yeah. yeah. I, gave, I, gave, I was giving her lessons on my days off. I had three days off every 10 days. I got three, 72 hours. I'd go into Honolulu and I'd meet with her and then I'd give her lessons. That lasted a year and I made a little extra money that way. But everything I did, it was music, music, music in the army. At the end of the war, they wouldn't send me home. They still needed me. But they gave, gave me a vacation. I never had a furlough. I didn't see my wife for three years. They gave me a 10-day vacation on the big, big island of Hawaii, where there was a rest camp for Pacific soldiers who came back, you know, for rest. And this is after the war. This is Christmas, uh, or December 1945. Christmas, Christmas week. So I went over to Big Island, Hawaii, and uh, it, was, it was a ball, seeing the volcanoes, you know, riding around on a bicycle, and having fun. But they also had a band there, because they had entertainment for the people there. Well, the poor piano player couldn't play the music that they brought in, that the, the singers and the dancers brought in. So I've... I, I, I naturally I gravitated to, to the band right away. I said, "Well, I'll, I'll do it for him." So I played.
Christmas week was coming up, and, and I had nothing. I had no jobs. I had nothing. I got a call from a violinist. He says, would you like to go away for a week of Christmas? I said, yeah, what do I have to do? He says, just play piano. I haven't played accordion. <laughs> All of a sudden, I started to play piano. It's a different feel, because the, and the keys on the accordion are closer to each other. You know, they're, they're more. Um, so uh, I said, yeah, we'll go to we'll a winter resort for a week. And I can take my wife with me. That was our honeymoon, a year and a half after we got married. Beethoven, Mozart, you know. I said, Vivaldi, I said, oh, you, you got to be kidding. Yeah, just piano and violin. I said, I haven't played that stuff in years. You know, any kind of classical music. But I could read. So we did that. Just after dinner, that was our job, after dinner, play for an hour. Play piano and violin music in the lounge while people were sitting around. And we played Beethoven Sonata, you know, Mozart, classical music. And that was a big change after playing a jazz quartet on accordion. That was, that was something. So you said there was a story with, uh, with your getting married. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We decided to get married. We got married. We got married in, a, in, a, in an apartment that belonged to a rabbi or something. It had to be a religious wedding that our father insisted on it. So we already had our license and, uh, you know, uh, so uh, we were married, in the, we were going to be married in the afternoon. But in the evening, I had a job in New York at Rockefeller Center at a restaurant on the roof uh, with, with a group that I was playing with. I said, I'm not going to give up that job. It's too much money to give up just because of a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> so we had that wedding, and the band I was playing with, that like, was six men, came to the wedding. They took up the, the whole room. They came to the wedding and played at the wedding. Right after the wedding, at 5, 5, 5.30 or something like that, we took off. I didn't see my wife for two days. <laughs> she was still living with her parents. And uh, we took off and we played the job. And it was a good paying job. I mean, you don't give it up. And that was one of the troubles with the music business. If something comes along, you're reluctant to, to let it go by if there's money involved, even though it upsets your other plans. How, how long were you married? We were married 71 years.
You are listening to the Wicked Good Music Hour here on Community Radio, WERU. I'm your host, Matt Murphy, and we are listening to a recording I made recently with Harry Weiss, a wonderful 97-year-old musician who lives in Bangor, sharing with us his life in music. Let's get back to Harry. I was in college. I was in City College. And there was a group called the Film and Sprocket Society. This is 1935, 36. Film and Sprocket Society. And they decided to show a silent film. And the film they were showing was... uh, It was by the guy who did The Birth of a Nation. Anyway, um, they decided to show this film. Oh, Intolerance. That was... uh, uh, he was criticized uh, for doing Birth of a Nation because it, it showed the Ku Klux Klan, you know, in the South and so forth, and lynching and whatnot. And uh, and sort of to rectify that a little bit, he did this thing called Intolerance to show intolerance through the ages in four different films uh, from the, from early times up to the modern times. And so they thought it would be nice to have a live pianist. Of course, there was some kind of score for it, you know, a recorded score. So who do you recommend? Well, I get, get Harry. He's always playing everywhere. He's, he's playing. He runs this place musically. <laughs> so they got. I said, okay, let me, let me. I'll, I'll do it. And I had never done it before. They said, okay, you go down to the Museum of Modern Art, and you can get the score for the film. So I said, okay. Well, what do I do with the score? Well, you play the score. They follow the film with the music that they have. Well, I went down, I went down to the Museum of Modern Art and I got that score. I said, they gotta be kidding. It's all classical music. Some of it I could never play with my fingers anyway. Then I would have to practice the music and then practice the music with the film so that the timings are right. So I don't keep playing music when they're already in the next scene. <laughs> I mean, that had to be right. I said, forget it. I can't do it. Not only that, what... I mean, I, I saw the movie. They showed me the movie. I mean, you, you have guys on strike in, a, just a, in the modern section, modern uh, period. They're on strike, you know, and, and the bosses are uh, discriminating against them and so forth. And the music they have is a Beethoven sonata. A fast movement for a strike, guys on strike. What kind of music is that? I said, well, you've got to have workers' music, you know. Uh, we shall not be moved. <laughs> Something. Um, <laughs> that sort of thing, you know. I'm not going to play. I can't play this. I'll play my own stuff, uh, you know. And uh, they said, okay, you, know, you want to do it, do it. I did it. And it worked very well, because I just let them, the scenes, let the scenes direct me in what I played. Uh, fortunately, I can improvise. So uh, it worked well. And, uh, and then I got into, so I got into, and I was invited by a church to play uh, continuous performances on Saturdays from 12 noon to 12 midnight in the basement. They were showing silent movies. They, they invited me, somebody they heard about me, they invited me to play, and I got, I got paid for it. You know, that, that was a paying job, for, <laughs> fortunately. Um, and they showed old films, and then I noticed, I did that for almost a year, I noticed that there's a different kind of audience in the afternoon than an audience in the evening. In the afternoon, you have people who are serious about the movie, and they're quiet, they're listening to the music, they're watching the movie. In the evening, you have kids on dates. They're coming in there, it's a big joke to them. You know, silent movie, why can we, it's hilarious, they're laughing, everything's funny. Well, that affected what I played. So if I did a thing like the Phantom of the Opera, Lon Chani, the Phantom of the Opera, I played serious music in the afternoon. In the evening audience, they were fooling around, kidding around, laughing at everything. So I said, I'll go along with it, and I did. And they liked it. They liked my fooling around with the, with the film, too. So that when she unmasks the phantom, 
Well, usually I play a, a real discordant big chord on the piano, you know, it's a sort of surprise thing. This thing I played, uh, well, at that time I played by Mir Bis to Shane, uh, which is, was an old song in, in, the, uh, in the 40s, the 30s and 40s. Andrew says it's made it popular. It was an old Jewish song. And uh, by me, Mr. Shum, means you look pretty to me, which is a translation. Well, later on, I did the same thing for another audience, a college audience, and I realized what was going on, but they wouldn't know that song. You, you didn't know that song either. So I played, You Light Up My Life. You know that one? Mm -hmm. I, I played that. They laughed. They were funny. You, she's... <laughs> So these are the things that you do, you know, you have to go along with the crowd sometimes. Earlier you mentioned that you have small hands, yeah, well, and, and and they're arthritic. You can and, see it. You see my fingers are small. I have a, a big palm, but fingers are small. I can't reach. So, in spite of that, you've had this long, 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 long career in music. Right. Yeah. And now, music at age ninety-seven, almost ninety-eight, music still has a very important does, part yeah. of your life. Can you yeah. talk about that? what music is for you now? Well, music is what I, I, I would say. I mean, uh, it's what's keeping me going. Of course, I still have my head about me. I can talk about other things besides music, you know, but uh, I can talk about politics. I can talk about what's happening in the world. I can talk about uh, galaxies. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the, but the, the music is, a, I find there's a need for me. I go to bed at night. I get into bed. And I don't know what people think about when they get into bed, but I start hearing music, and I'm working out arrangements in my head of, of different things. 
And, and sometimes it's a, it's a piece of music that I haven't heard in 20 years. You know, it all suddenly hits me. And I fall asleep that way. And there were times, not so much lately, but there were times until, until about, well, until about six months ago, I would have dreams about playing music, but I was always playing, and I was playing fantastic stuff that I know I could never play. <laughs> you know? But I was playing, and, uh, but I was playing, on, on, and, and I couldn't understand why my fingers weren't moving as fast as I was playing, see? And then I sort of wake up and find out I was playing on a, on a keyboard, on a, on a tabletop. I was playing all kinds of great music on a tabletop, even though in my dream it was a big piano. <laughs> but I'd wake up playing on a tabletop. I said, that's, that's ridiculous. But music always um, very important to me. How, how, you have uh, in your room, you have a beautiful piano um, recording uh, equipment. How much do you play a day? Uh, I better look at the clock. <laughs> I play, well, uh, I've been playing, I cut back. I play every day, but now I play five days a week from 4.30 to 5 outside before dinner. For for other people living here? For other people. I have a whole list, a book of songs of all kinds, and I I mix them up, you know, I, I just play from a list, and what people might request something, I play for them. I have a, a big repertoire in my head, of old music. And uh, I'll play anything from a, a Brahms Hungarian dance to two guitars to a St. Louis Woman or something like that, you know, or uh, Song of the Islands. <laughs> and uh, I will admit, though, that on some of those old songs, I don't remember the bridge, the release. I know the first 16 bars, and I don't remember the bridge, so I make it up a little bit, and I say, I can do that because they don't know it. They don't remember it. And it sounds logical, so I do, I do that. Not too often. I try to get the original. But I have three fake books that go back to 1947. Um, so if I'm looking for a song, that somebody wants a song and I don't really exactly remember the, all, all the exact notes to it, I look it up and see if they have it in that book. And I, It's just a a lead sheet, you know, just a melody line. And they have the chords written over it if I need it, the harmony. And, and I use that. But this book is, uh, this, um, it's on the bed because i got to put it in here before I go out to play later. So remember to take it with me. I also try to arrange it by what they like here. And one night a week I play old stuff. Put your arms around me, honey. Hold me tight. You know that one? You made me love you. I didn't want to do it, you know. The music goes round and round. Dun, 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 dun. So I, I play the overly old stuff. Um, uh, yes, we have no bananas. We have no bananas. You know that one? Mm -hmm. That's another story. I work with the guy. <laughs> Horace Silva.
this was 19, I'm going, I gotta go by year. This was 1930, 34, 34. I connected with WHN in New York. I was on the studio list. I, I mean, I, I became a, a sort of studio pianist, you know, on the, on the list, available. People maybe, and they'd rent me out to different places. They sent me on a New Year's Eve job to play piano in a private home. I said, that's nice, that's easy. Because all I do is play, you know, improvise, play popular songs, you know. And you see it in the movies. You know, they have these parties in the homes where there's somebody playing the piano. You know, and I had my tuxedo, of course. And, you know, this is on West End Avenue in New York. I go up there, I get there at 12, and the butler lets me in. Nobody else there. It's 12 o'clock, nobody in there. He lets me in. I said, where's everybody? He says, they'll be here in about a half hour. I said, well, what do I do? He says, just wait till they come. So I sat down at the piano, was fooling around a little bit. They started to come in at 12.30, ignored me completely. They came in, they were drunk. <laughs> they, they had been partying, you know. And uh, then at a quarter to one, he came over to me. I said, I play, played. He came over to me, he says, you can quit, you can go, you can leave now. I said, this guy got here. He said, no, they don't know you, they don't know you're here. They paid me off and I got a nice payment for that. And that was a great job. <laughs> <laughs> New Year's Eve. There were a lot of things like that. There, there, there's, there's so many stories and incidents and crazy things that happen in the music business. Well, Harry, I want to thank you for uh, taking some time to talk with me well, today. Well, it's not my time, it's your time. i got plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs>
This edition of the Wicked Good Music Hour has featured a recorded interview with Harry Weiss, 97 years young and still playing strong. In fact, all the great music you heard on the show today was recently performed and recorded by Harry at the Philip Strickland House in Bangor. In order of appearance, we heard Easy to Remember, A Sunday Kind of Love, I Only Have Eyes for You, Night and Day, and As Time Goes By. Let's fill up the balance of the hour with more of Harry's playing with More Than You Know. Thanks very much for listening to and supporting Community Radio, and thanks for listening to the Wicked Good Music Hour. And, of course, thanks to Harry Weiss.